thing, but this is a brave thing to sit and, you know, answer questions that um, I've actually <laughs> put together. I hope everybody feels comfortable with that. To begin with, and I'm, it's going to be a panel, so I will ask the question and then pass the microphone down for each to answer. Can you hear? Can everybody hear? All right. You have one minute each. <laughs> Please tell us the story of how you first came to Unitarian Universalist. Don't get me talking. Yeah. Ruth and I were uh, looking for something different and uh, for quite some time. We even considered starting our own church, calling it the Church of the Forest Preserve, where we took our dogs on Sunday. Um, then came the pandemic, and uh, we played it pretty, pretty close. Uh, we just went to the grocery store, wore our masks, disinfected the whole house 20 times a day. We didn't do anything, but Ruth found the church online. So once the pandemic was over, um, she said one Sunday, she said, let's go see what it's like. So we did, and the rest is history. I'll start with when I first heard of Universalist. Um, I was in college, I was doing my field work in um, Danville, Illinois. Uh, one winter I got stuck in the snow and went to the nearest house and rang the doorbell and asked if I could use the phone because we didn't have cell phones back then. And there was a, an elderly man and he let me in and he let me use the phone and I noticed that he, he had been sitting reading a Bible. And after I got off the phone, I said, you know, my friends will pick me up in a little while. And um, I asked him about what he was reading. And he told me that he was a universalist. And he told me about the religion. I don't even, well, he told me how open and how um, there was no dogma. And, and what he told me was exactly how I felt. So years later, um, not maybe six years ago after kind of bouncing around and going to Catholic Bible study and the Unity Church. And I went online and I took a test about what I believed and what I didn't. And it said, you're a universalist. So <laughs> that's, I started coming here. Um, I think I grew up in the Episcopal tradi tradition and uh, my mother I strangely grew up here even though I didn't but uh, we when Pat and I were married we st we decided oh we should probably find community as we move into this new house in Beverly and so we found community and found friends two of them over a zucchini which could be explained later um, <laughs> but um, uh, we started out with and found some uh, a parish or a, a community that spoke to us we started out Holy Nativity. We tried off multiple churches in the area, and we were at Holy Nativity for a while with Father Nako, who really spoke to us, and he retired, and that found that drifting away from that, and we we kind of reevaluated re what we were looking for and looking for our new child, and tr visited lots of places and found this this place, and found that it matched both Pat and I's uh, uh, leanings <laughs> and uh, fit fit who we are now and the community fit who we are, who we are and what we needed. So it's a lovely place. In our denomination, we find atheists, agnostics, Christians, Buddhists, sacred humanists, pagans, and more. Can you tell us where you are today, religiously speaking? How many minutes? <laughs> On Sundays, when I was a kid, it was the same thing every morning. 
get ready, you're going to church. I don't want to go to church. Get ready, you're going to church. We went to church. I felt weird my whole life as a child because I knew things. Not up here, but I felt things. And I always felt odd. So um, it, it was second nature to be involved with Christianity. But I made the mistake of reading the Bible. The, uh, I, I make no claim of being a theologian or anything like that, but I did read it in earnest for three hours a day for about 12 years. And there, there, uh, it just, it, it, Christianity, it gave me a bad taste in my mouth about Christianity. So in answer to your question, where I'm at today, is right where I belong, right here, with you people. We came here the first time. I knew it the second I walked in the door that this was right. Jean came running over to greet us, and she was very warm and welcoming. Her husband and I connected without ever even saying a word, just through fist bumps, because we all had masks on still. So I'm where I belong, and thank you. Um, I guess you can talk a lot about this, but I, I went to a Catholic grammar school. Um, I always questioned everything, you know, and I noticed that most people around me didn't. You know, they just believed what they were told. And I, I just couldn't believe in a God who was like a person who was jealous or angry or um, made a hell. I don't believe in hell. I, I just can't see it. You know, I don't, you know, so it was more about what I didn't believe, and later it was about what I do believe. You know, I believe, um, growing up in the Christian re religion, um, I believe in the teachings of Jesus. I don't think that he came here as the only son of God to um, die on the cross and save us from our sins. That, that I don't, I, I believe in his, you know, the golden rule and, and his moral teachings and that he taught us the way. And I know most about the Christian religion, but I do like to read about, you know, different faiths. And, you know, what I believe is, is um, I'm just open to, to anything, but I do believe like, that there's a um, higher power. God to me is, is more of a, a connection, you know, of what we all have in common. And I think we're all connected and I can't really say too much more. I don't have a, um, a label, you know, of what I believe or don't believe. I just, you know, question everything and believe in some things. <laughs> so, as I said, I grew up in the Episcopal tra tradition mostly due to my mother. My father grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition and had rejected that, I think, by the time I came, I came along. And uh, I kind of followed that with my mother, with my sister, through, you know, high school. And then, of course, at that point, things kind of fa have started falling apart and falling out of that. And I was, I grew up in Colorado, camping, hiking, being outside all the time, and backpacking. And so I found more solace, more focus, more connectiveness in being outside in the trees, in the woods, in Colorado. There's places that are very special to me in Colorado growing up that I still have dreams about. But um, those became far more important to me. I think over time, I didn't participate in any of this over, over college career, I was outside. And that's where I found peace. And I think over time, we went back to the Episcopal tradition, mostly for community, I think, for, for me, and tradition. There's a structure and a tradition to church service, to the worship. But I think, you know, as time went on, found that I think I've evolved more into an agnostic humanist. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, through dealings with students for 26 years and just kind of living in the world today and this community accepts that and and fulfills those needs of community and those needs of connectiveness and yeah 
like that. <laughs> All right, Keith, tell us how you learn the skills you share with the Beverly Unitarian Church. Who was your mentor? And since you joined BUC, you have definitely helped in so many ways. Did you know as a young person that making and fixing things made you happy? Does anybody remember what they were doing on June 3rd, 1968, at 7 o'clock in the morning? Because I do. I met a guy in front of a concrete foundation that I had never seen before in my life. He pulled up in a pickup truck, and he got out, and he said, your job is to roll out the extension cords. And then he left. The extension cords were in the back of the truck, like 200 pounds of spaghetti. They were all knotted up, all tied together. And in a few minutes, a big crew of guys was there, and they were all yelling at me. Um, I fell in love with it at the end of that day, <laughs> in spite of the spaghetti mess. And I learned how to roll up extension cords in the meantime. I, I was very lucky to have several good teachers. One was my uncle, who literally kicked me in the backside if I made a mistake. And I mean literally. Uh, another one was my boss, who was not that good of a carpenter, but he was a very good businessman. And the third one is a guy that will stay with me till the day I die. His name was Walter. He was an old time trimmer. And on days when the framing crew got rained out, I would go find Walter wherever he was working, whichever house it was, and I would say, Walter, let me help you. I don't want any money. I don't, you know, just let me help you, teach me. And Walter would look at me and he would shake his finger at me every time and say, son, you're never gonna be a good frame carpenter until you learn how to be a good trimmer. And then he'd let that sink in for a minute, and then he'd go, you're never going to learn how to be a good trimmer until you learn how to be a good framer. <laughs> so at first I was a little lost, but after a while I got it. And, and now I'm to a point where Ruth and I, when we got married, we went on a cruise. And by the second day, I was looking for broken doorknobs to fix. I, I just, it's, <laughs> It's, it's second nature, I just, I can't help it. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I always thank God for, uh, thank God, for Walter. Walter gave me that message and, and my boss being a good businessman helped me. You know, we did, we built a lot of houses and, uh, and later on I got in, I switched over to renovating and so, here I am. I'm an old man now, and I'm still looking for broken doorknobs. You're not done. You shared with me that you played in a band called the Outlaws. Would you like to share how that happened, and do you still dabble in music? I listen to music. Uh, all night long, all the time. I'm, I'm an old hardcore rock and roller. I traded my guitar for a hammer, and after 56 years of smashed and broken fingers, there's no way I could even play two notes. But I love it. It's inside of me. It's in my soul. It was a good time. If you think of it, back in the 60s, when minimum wage was a dollar and a quarter an hour, we could play out two nights a week on the weekend, they make a hundred bucks each. That's like you're, we felt like rock stars. We weren't, but we felt like rock stars. <laughs> Vicki, you're retired now after working for the state of Illinois. Since retirement, you've been volunteering twice a week at a local food pantry. Please tell us about this work and the benefits shared with the community. The food pantry I volunteered at is uh, the Southeast Chicago um, Food Pantry. 
and it's located on 114th in Green Bay, East Side. Um, I was looking for something to do. Uh, I wanted to volunteer, thought maybe a library or reading to, to people in a um, nursing home. Um, but this came to me, uh, they were looking for volunteers. Somebody sent me a uh, text saying that they were looking for some. So I went and, oh man, it's work, it's work. It's two days a week. Uh, we, we get an average of maybe 240 families that come in every week. Uh, lately, we've been getting a lot of migrants. We get, you know, we have our regulars. Uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesday, the trucks come in. We unload the trucks. We pack the food. A uh, lot of physical labor keeps me fit. Uh, Wednesdays, uh, we pack the produce and we distribute the food. And that is actually a lot of fun. I mean, the people come in, you're working nonstop, people are grateful. Sometimes they bring their children. Um, sometimes we get stuff to give to the kids, like little toys and everything. But it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think it helps the community. When we started getting the migrants in our community, we started telling them about it. And first they were coming with um, some paper identifications from the city of Chicago. Because it's the food pantry is open to the zip code 60617 and 33 that community except on the third friday of every month anybody could come we have produce day so it's actually um two days a week and then one friday a month uh, so like i said it's a lot of fun uh, most of the volunteers are retirees like me we get some young people which is very helpful <laughs> Um, sometimes people come because the courts have ordered them to do volunteer work, it's usually people that um, got in some kind of trouble, DUIs or whatever, but it's, it's very helpful and they fit right in. You also are a member of a social club at the YMCA. There have been many trips taken with this group of friends to local and distant destinations. Would you like to share your experience of travel and perhaps one or two of your most memorable? Well, first, the South Chicago community, I always say is like a small town in a big city. Um, my grandparents came over in the 1920s and my parents went to school, or at least my mother did, went to school in the community. So this is the South Chicago YMCA Senior Club. The South Chicago YMCA closed actually in 2017 due to lack of funds, but the club is still going. We meet at a different location. We meet once a month. We take trips, bus trips. We just went to Cape Cod in June. We went to South Dakota last fall. We've been to Niagara Falls, um, Branson, Missouri, just different fun things. And we, it was attracted to me, them to me in the first place was that uh, they, they held dances, a uh, Christmas dance and a spring dance. And when I went to the first meeting, I saw that most of the people I went to high school with, or um, and their parents belonged to the club first. So there's about 300 and something members. Honorary members are those that are 80 plus. And <laughs> so I'm kind of like a junior, junior senior because <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we do a lot of fun things, and we have day trips, like we're going to do a South, uh, White Sox trip in July. We've done um, trips to uh, just the boat trips on, off the Chicago River. So it's, it's a lot of fun, and it really helps that, I mean, it's really nice that a lot of people know each other. When we go on the trips, I run into people that knew my parents or my older brother or whatever. So. That's a lot of fun. Most of us don't even live in South Chicago anymore. We live in Indiana or the East Side or Hegwish, but you know we we still get together. All right. Last but not least, Chris, you've lived in various places in the United States, including Florida, Alaska, and Colorado. What brought you to Chicago? No, um, uh, divorce. <laughs> um, uh, I I grew up in Colorado, and uh, I'm working in entertainment industry for 30 years, in one form or another. 
but um, I went to school in Colorado and traveled around that area, I know that area very well, northern, northern New Mexico, Utah, that whole zone. And um, <clears throat> I just decided, we decided one year to go to Alaska for, for a while and come back. Um, and ended up in Kansas, ended up in various places because of the industry. Also tried to go to grad school at University of Kansas in Lawrence and was got married at, at some point in there. Um, and unfortunately that fell apart and we moved to Florida. We moved to Florida, that fell apart. So I ended up in Florida for a while on my own, um, trying to sort things out and uh, went out, did some sailing, did some, tried to buy a motorcycle so I could go around the, down to South America on a motorcycle. That didn't work out. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but found a, uh, a job listing finally in uh, Chicago. And I came up here because my parents, my mom grew up here, strangely, 6, uh, 111th Street. And uh, my father grew up in Brazil and Germany and ended up here because of sponsorship. And so I came to Chicago because just by happenstance, there was a job offer here and uh, lived on the north side for a while, met Pat, we got married and we were looking for a house and ended up down here because gosh, we can afford a house and then you can park. Um, <laughs> and it's a lovely community and all that. So, um, and we met Katrina and Jeff over a zucchini. I, I witnessed your skill in the kitchen when we were preparing meals for the migrants at the police station. Where did that interest begin? Well, two parts to this. Um, both my parents were really good cooks, and my father was a very good, both of them were very good cooks. I, I spent a lot of time learning how to cook in the kitchen there. And then, um, uh, uh, I, one of the things, if you're in the entertainment industry, that's gig work, you're working various things. So gosh, what else works with that? Um, working in a restaurant situation, working in that kind of stuff. So I'm not, a, I'm not an onstage person, ask anybody. Um, <laughs> I don't like being in front of the camera. I don't like being in front of the lights in the lights. I much prefer being backstage in the dark. Prep cook, gosh, doing some of that work um, is very easy to pick up. Um, and I'll, that's why when we went to Alaska, that's what I did. Um, so, uh, and I've just been kind of a, a dilettante and I love food and love foodie type stuff before it was foodie. And <laughs> so, yes, I, so I've done a lot of that, a lot of that stuff and self, self education too, took classes and things like that. So. Now that you have Moxie, which for those, let, let Chris explain what that means. What adventures do you think you'd like to pursue? Moxie is our 42-foot uh, sailboat that we have been working on for a year and a half, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, just a couple months, yeah. Um, it just went in the water about six, six weeks ago, something like that, eight weeks ago. And we are uh, at the point of being able to really sail her. Um, and um, I think right now we're just kind of getting comfortable with sailing. Pat and I spent the day docking the boat all day yesterday. Dock, driving in, driving out, driving in, driving out. Um, but, um, and no one died. <laughs> Didn't hit anything. Um, uh, but no, I think we're looking forward to having, you know, friends come and sail with us and to kind of learn over the summer, you know, how uh, the boat and kind of build a relationship similarly to our VW van that we camp, have camped in for years. Um, and, uh, you know, I have kind of thoughts of doing longer trips across the lake in the Great Lakes area. Um, and there's always that dream of, well, gosh, we could go to the Caribbean. Um, but I think we just have to see right now, but I think for now, we're just going to enjoy being on the water. Um, 
It's a lovely day for it. Um, <laughs> All right, last question for each of you. If you had a, bu a bucket list, what one thing would be on it? Well, the one thing that was at the top of the list was being on your panel. So thank you very much. Thank you both. So, so <laughs> So the, ne the next thing down the line is I always wanted to have a little cabin or a trailer or something on a lake and take the dogs there and have a little fishing boat. And now I know Chris. <laughs> <laughs> My bucket list, some, some I've already done. Uh, traveling, I, I have two things. For traveling, I'd like to go to every state. I'd like to visit every continent except for um, Antarctica because I'm not that adventurous. And so I've, I've got two more continents to visit. I've done a lot of traveling since I've retired outside of the country. Um, the other thing on my bucket list is writing. I just don't know if I'll ever get to that, but short stories I'd like to write. That's about it. Um. So I purposely didn't talk to Pat about this list, but um, I grew up in a family that at Christmas and holiday dinners with the entire small family that we have, there were about four languages being spoken at the dinner table. And uh, uh, I, would, I, I would really like to take a year and just tr travel and go around the world for a year and stop at different places and different spots that I've always wanted to visit or Pat has always wanted to visit um, and just spend that time to to see places where my family grew up, places where I've never been, cultures that I've never been, um, and just have that experience. I, I've always been an experiential learner and decided, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try making uh, uh, pickled cabbage. I'm going to try and uh, learn, teach myself how to use a metal lathe. I'm going to try and build things out of fiberglass or whatever. Um, so I kind of I want to have that that travel experience. Um, and now that I think it's possible. I would like to thank you, all three of you for volunteering and, um, and providing us with such interesting life stories. We are the better for, for this, and thank you so much. And we're now going to sing hymn number 346, Come Sing a Song With Me. Yeah. 
that I might know your mind and I bring you home when hope is hard to find and I bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time come walk in rain with me come walk in rain that I might know your mind. And I'll give you hope when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Come share a rose with me. that I might know your mind. And I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter. Our, our closing words this morning are taken from the story that I, um, I earlier I read. You don't have to climb any tree at all because there are plenty of good things down here on the ground. So frequently I come with an idea of what I'm going to play and then sit here and listen to what you all have to say and completely change my mind and that's true today. So I'd like to play kind of a, a song that some of you may not know. It's a rock song from almost 20 years ago by a strange sounding group, Deaf Cab for Cutie. And I think it's a song you would really like though um, because the text of it talks about the couple having no idea what's to come when their lives are ended, but the desire to go forth uh, together. I will follow you into the dark. Thank you. 